Zelensky. I am delighted to be here. Salamu alaikum, Pax Domini Bobiskum, peace be with all of you. First of all, I would like to introduce my dear friend, Houston Smith. Professor Houston Smith will say a few words first. I have a pretty good projection voice. Do I need a no, microphone? <laughs> what shall I do? I'm already wired. <laughs> well, my instructions was, were to thy was to welcome you. <laughs> And here we are, deep into the afternoon program. Well, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome, friends. I'm Bill Moyers. When it comes to the comparative study of religion, Houston Smith literally wrote the book. The World's Religions, or The Religion of Man as it was once titled, has been a perennial bestseller for decades and a staple of introduction to religion courses. I remember reading it when I was a young seminarian almost 50 years ago. Few books have so informed my life in government, publishing, and journalism. Houston Smith opened my mind to the power of religion in cultures the world over and their impact on human events. We go over on Memorial Day, and uh, out in Olima, there's this Point Reyes station. The Vedanta Society has this marvelous piece of property and herds of white deer and trees and that go right down to the beach. And wonderful, wonderful place. And of course, all the ambiance of a cultivating monastery with swamis. And, and on that day, they put up a big tent and thousands of people come from all over the Bay Area. It's really an annual event. So uh, Master Hua was there, and, uh, and I was the translator. And when it came time for questions, the first question, there was a white-haired professor in the front row who stood up and said, he said, excuse me, venerable sir, my name is Professor Smith, and I was born in Suzhou, China. Chinese was my first language. Houston Smith was born in 1919 in rural China to missionary parents. His family was very well respected and lived their Christian religious beliefs, helping the poor and teaching by example. In all his explorations of the world's religions, Houston never had cause to give up his bedrock Christian roots. In 1936, Houston came to America for his college education at Central Methodist University, Missouri. At first, Houston expected that after graduation, he would return to China and continue his family's missionary work. But the bright lights of Fayette, Missouri dazzled him and helped shape his decision to change his career from missionary to clergy. The academic life greatly influenced Houston. Late night discussions with fellow students and professors lit all his filaments. One night after one of these discussion sessions, Houston had his first great epiphany, some kind of spiritual awakening, causing another change in career direction from clergy to scholarly study of religion. Houston attended graduate school at the University of Chicago under the direction of noted religious thinker Henry Nelson Wyman, who linked contemporary Western religion with modern scientific theories. While doing research for his doctoral thesis, Houston was looking for books on the subject of pain and happened to run across Gerald Hurd's book, Pain, Sex, and Time. Being the most interesting title of the books in hand, Houston read and read the whole night through. 
At the time, Gerald Hurd was a noted author and lecturer. In the early 30s, he was the BBC science commentator. H.G. Wells once said he was the only person he would listen to on the wireless. Houston found something so profound in Hurd's writing that he made a vow not to read anything else by him until he received his PhD, and that once his union card was in hand, he would read everything by him. During his time at the University of Chicago, Houston met Wyman's daughter, Eleanor, now Kendra. They were married in 1943. In 1944, the first of three daughters was born, Karen in 1944, Gail in 1947, and Kim in 1949. After getting his PhD, Houston taught at the University of Colorado and the University of Denver. Then in 1947, Houston accepted a teaching position at Washington University in St. Louis. But before moving east, he decided to try and meet Gerald Hurd. Through Hurd's publisher, Houston found an address for him at Tribuco Canyon in Southern California. Hurd had established an ashram called the College of All Religions. Gerald Hurd and Aldous Huxley had traveled from England before the war to Hollywood and studied under Swami Prabhavananda, the founder of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. Gerald wanted to experiment with monastic living and raise funds to build Tribuco College. Huxley spent a good deal of time there as well, including a six-week stretch while working on the perennial philosophy. Houston hitchhiked to Tribuco and hit it off with Hurd who asked him if he would care to meet Aldous Huxley. Houston was eager to do so. Before leaving Southern California, Houston met with Maria and Aldous Huxley at their desert retreat. Later, Houston would describe what a marvelous experience it was to walk with Aldous in the desert, discussing the desert fathers and the nature of reality, all of which was stunning for a young man to be in the company of his hero. It was suggested by Hurd that Houston should look up the Vedanta Society once he settled in St. Louis. Swami Satprakashananda was the founder and head of the center. At first, Houston found it a little exotic, a Swami in orange robes and Hindu trappings. Houston had tremendous contribution to the Vedanta Society of St. Louis. He was the president of our society. He brought his students from the Washington University to Swami Satprakashananda and introduced them with the Swami. Then in 1951, Swami Satprakashananda wanted to buy a house. And there was a little racial prejudice in that area at that time. The owner of the house did not want to sell the house to Swami. So the present house was bought in Houston and his wife Kendra's name. Then Houston transferred that property to the Vedanta Society. At Washington University, the dean has decided that the school should broaden its outlook to include courses that would give students a perspective on the world. Since World War II, a broader worldview would perhaps help the cause of world peace. Houston is the new man in the philosophy department. He is given the assignment. This is the genesis of Houston's Religion of Man, later to be retitled The World's Religions. Before, during, and after this time, Houston is not only studying the world's religions, but is actually practicing them, not content to just know the bare facts of the roots and practices. He wants to experience them. I first met Houston in India, but as you probably know, there's two ways of meeting Houston. There's one way through his books, and there's the other way of meeting Houston, which is through meeting Houston and actually being with Houston and experiencing the joy of being with Houston. I'd already met Houston through the books uh, before I met the human being Houston. 
and I was very impressed by the books. I, I think a lot of us were deeply moved by the religions of man, what later became the world's religions, because through each chapter you're successively converted into each each religion. So you're like, oh yeah, this is this is fabulous. This is it makes total sense. Then you move on to the next. One. This is good. So I thought this this man really. First of all, he can write. Second of all, there was something in the, coming from the inside, which was very different from other books that I'd read on religious studies. What particularly impressed me was meeting him and seeing that tie in. Because you had a man who was a, a person who was obviously a practitioner, who was coming from his experience as a scholar from the inside out, not from the outside in. So you had the, 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 the feeling of total, even more than sympathy, it was, it was a deep empathy which, which carried through. And it makes a huge difference when you read something to have that sense of, of it being an experiential. In 1955, Houston's lecture series on the world's religions is televised through National Educational Television, NET, the predecessor of PBS, which gave many Americans their first exposure to Zen, Vedanta, and Islam. The lecture series became the book, which is first published in 1958 and has since sold millions of copies. Production number 115, scene one, take one. Dr. Suzuki, are there any moral codes that uh, every society must adopt if it is not to destroy itself? Well, there is, yes. What, what would these be? Well, that is love. Love? Yes. But that love cannot be included in, uh, in uh, moral codes, perhaps. Why not? Because love transcends morality. It transcends morality? Yes. Uh, now, just how? How does it transcend? When we say good, well, we think of evil in contrast to good. But love transcends good as well as uh, bad. In 1958, Houston accepted a position at MIT and moved his family to Boston. In 1960, Houston is given a budget to bring a guest lecturer for a semester and calls on his friend Aldous Huxley. This creates a sensation. The lecture series is wildly successful, creating traffic problems throughout the Boston area and an overflow packed hall. It is suggested by Huxley that Houston contact Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary at Harvard University to give insight into the reported mystical experiences through LSD and mescaline. The point that interests me is that whereas the ordinary everyday experience is of course absolutely essential most of the time, it's not the only possible experience. There are also other types of consciousness, I mean the artist type, the mystics type and so on, which uh, have uh, empirically an enormous value and may help people to live less self-centered and more charitable lives and more understanding lives. In 1962, Smith participated in what would later be called the Good Friday experiments, meant to induce mystical experiences through religious settings while under the influence of LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin. At the time, these drugs were not only legal, but considered quite legitimate research subject. In 1967, while traveling in India, Houston makes what he calls the single most important empirical discovery of his career. While listening to the Tibetan monks chanting, he hears and recognizes that each monk is producing multiphonic chords from their voices. Houston records them and then back at MIT has acoustic scientists confirm his findings. The music of Tibet is introduced to the West. In 1973, Houston accepted a position at Syracuse University. While there, he came to realize that he had left out Native American religions from his great book. In my uh, formal education of religion, I say that with a wry smile, uh, was taught that they were primitive with the pejorative uh, built solidly into that word. 
And therefore, the, no reason to pay any attention to them except for a historical reason. What the old people felt way back in the childhood of the human race. And I would have gone out my life in that mode if I hadn't moved to Syracuse where I was moving into the shade of the Onondaga Reservation and that 10 years that I was there absolutely transformed my view of the indigenous religion and I am so grateful I will not go to my grave not having entered a final chapter in the second edition of my book. Houston also became involved with the case to legalize peyote for Native American religious ritual. A decade-long struggle finally succeeded in recognizing the right to practice the religious traditions of the Native Americans. In 1996, Bill Moyers devoted a five-part PBS series the Wisdom of Faith with Houston Smith, a documentary of his life and work and a review of the religions of the world. For half a century, Houston Smith has immersed himself in the world's great religions, but along the way, something happened. What began as an intellectual pursuit turned into a spiritual journey. The professor of philosophy became a pilgrim, the object of his intellect now the source of his desire. He tells his students that the goal of faith is not altered states, but altered traits life transformations. Religion alive, he says, calls the soul to the highest adventure it can undertake, a journey across the jungles, peaks, and deserts of the human spirit for the purpose of confronting reality. For the last few years, I've been completing a small book on the 14th Dalai Lama. Thinking about him, I've had occasion to realize, as so many of us have, that part of his power lies in his warm heart his constant attentiveness, his readiness to talk, to listen to everyone. Part of it lies in the lightness with which he moves for all his learning and responsibilities, and in spite of all that he has seen and lost. Much of it lies in the most important thing of all, which is that his wisdom is not just paper knowledge, but can be felt and seen, vividly savoured in his every gesture and action. How can I ever begin to understand the 14th Dalai Lama, I asked myself. And then I thought of what I take to be his kindred spirit, my long-time hero, master of all traditions, though committed to one, traveler and teacher and ready student, presence of inexhaustible grace. Thank you, Professor Smith, for all you have given one who had never met you for 30 years, and so many millions more. My other and final comment is, someone once asked Mahatma Gandhi, wouldn't it be wonderful if goodness were as contagious as the common cold? <laughs> <laughs> and he answered, when will we ever learn that goodness is as contagious as the common cold? <laughs> so I'm going to leave this day a better person. The goodness of His Holiness and all of us who are joined together in the noble task because I've caught the contagious <laughs> from you and from all of you. Ha, 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 ha.